What a wonderful and powerful prayer time that was. Wow. That's why we're here, folks. My house, he says, we call it a house of prayer for all people. And I thank God that he's liberating us and letting us pray. And that's what it's about. All right. I want you to take two places. Mark your Bible at Psalm 139. By the way, thank you for watching us online today. We trust the Lord bless you. Psalm 139, I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. And then go to Genesis 28. So you're going to mark one, Psalm 139. And then Genesis 28, I'm going to talk to you today about the presence of God. The presence of God. Okay, I'm giving you time now. Good to hear the pages turning. If you mark Psalm 139, which we'll come to in a minute, we're going to go to Genesis 28. Jacob has deceived his brother. His father stolen the birthright. And in Genesis 28, verse 10, says Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. It says in verse 11, he came to a certain place. And that in the Hebrew language, that literally means he came to literally the middle of nowhere. He was a nowhere man in a nowhere land. And that's important because it's in the middle of nowhere that he's going to experience the presence of God. Okay? And he stayed there all night because the sun had set. And of course you know the story. He takes a stone and of course puts his lamb skins and different things on it and makes a nice pillow falls asleep and he has a vision of not Jacob's ladder. It was a ziggurat. A ziggurat's like a pyramid type thing that's terraced. It goes up like this, like that. And in pagan tradition in that part of the world today it was a picture of man's attempt to work his way to God. But what had happened in the middle of the night that night, he awoke and saw angels going up and down, and at the bottom of it, God was there. And there's grace. He didn't work his way to God. Genesis 28. God came down to him. And that's the way it is with us. That's why in verse 13 it says, The Lord stood above and said, I'm the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. And he gives him the promise that he'll bless him like he promised Abraham and his father Isaac. And here, look at verse 16 now. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Sherry and I were riding home this past week from having preached her 97-year-old Aunt Velma's funeral in Hertford, uh, about 15 miles on the other side of Edenton. Northeastern North Carolina, where we grew up, is rural, it's agriculture, it's captivatingly beautiful. Uh, Edenton sits on a peninsula. It's an old colonial peninsula, meaning water on three sides. And it was the second capital in North Carolina. It's an old colonial town. It's like a little... Uh, William, Williamsburg you should go one day. We were coming home crossing the John River Bridge about a mile long and I'd just been in, just looking at the verdant green, everything, the beauty, uh, the sky was brilliant with a golden hue. 
And right at the top of that bridge, it occurred to me that every living thing on this planet, from the lowly ant to the mighty elephant, to the countless creatures in the sea, to sinful man, that every living thing on this planet is dependent for life upon a ball of gas 93 million miles away. What a humbling thought. We are infinitesimally small creatures. We're nothing. We're told that if God had made that sun just a little bit closer, we would burn up. A little bit further away, and we would freeze to death. And I looked at Sherry and told her what I was thinking. I said, Sherry, why don't we stop? Why don't people stop? And by the way, when was the last time you went on and pondered that? It's humbling. I said, why don't we stop and ponder that sometimes? And she hit the nail on the head. She said, because we're too busy. We're too busy. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 came to mind. Even if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden from those who are perishing. Whose minds the small God, Satan, of this world has blinded who do not believe. Unless the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ is the image of God should shine upon them. Unless they should see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ Satan does not need sins of the flesh. Satan does not need a life of, prost of prostitution or murder to destroy a man or woman and get him into hell. All he needs is busyness. Busyness. That's a great enemy today. Jesus warned about the cares of life making Christians unfruitful and making lost men and women totally neglect the cares of the soul and die eternally. The cares of life. Just making a living. I knew a lady down the eastern part of the state. She was not highly educated, but she was a thinker. And she used to say, Pastor, I believe the devil's in the economy. I remember thinking, what, what, is, what has the devil got to do with economics? She said, no, no, no. He's, he's driving men and women into hell because we're, husband and wife are working so hard day and night they never have time to stop and think about God. They'll get out here tomorrow morning. There's a million people in this county. And out on that belt line, it will be a maddening race. And we never stop to consider it. Can you imagine seeing a stampede of about 10,000 cows coming with horns? And, and, and it's a stampede. And somehow you're able to grab onto one of those steers by the horns. And boy, you're going here and there. I mean, it's dust everywhere. And let me tell you, you will stop and think, I I'm caught in a stampede. This is really dangerous. But men and men, women tomorrow morning will never stop one time on the belt line driving 80 miles an hour to work. To say this is madness. We're caught in a stampede. We had six kids in our family, by the way. We lived in a three bedroom, one bathroom house, and my mom did not work because that's the way my dad wanted it. My mom and dad prayed about that, and there were sacrifices, but it paid big dividends in all six of those children today. And I, I pondered this this past week, and that gold standard verse came to mind that says, Be still and know. That I am God. In the early 20th century, a scholar did a, a, a study, took him years, on the men and women in history that God had used mightily. And he finally came to what he believed was an irreduce, to the irreducible minimum to one common denominator they all had in mind, they all had in common. They were as different as snowflakes, racially, economically, where they lived. But he came to believe that the, the secret of their power was that they all lived day by day in a conscious and constant awareness of God's presence. And I think this is what the Holy Spirit had in mind when through Paul he said pray without ceasing. He said let God be the point of reference for your mind and you get distracted but come back to it and come back to it and come back to it. It's what I think the Holy Spirit had in mind when he told through Paul. He said we can bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. People, Christians are racked with anxiety and fear today. And the Lord says be still. And know that I'm God. And what does the rest of the verse say? I will be exalted among these nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. I'm going to have the last laugh. Psalm 2, it says, He that sits in the heaven shall laugh. I prayed, I did this morning. I said, Lord, sometime, either in this life or the next, let me hear you laugh. They're shaking their fists. They're making these schemes. We're going to overcome. We're going to place Satan in authority. <laughs> I'd love to hear him laugh. He says because he knows her day is coming. He's seen the last page of the book and how it ends. I don't want to focus, folks, 
on Jacob's dream, but instead of the new consciousness that he brought out of the dream. And, and he says the next morning, he did not say, surely the Lord was in this place last night. What did he say? Surely the Lord is right now and forevermore in this place, literally in the middle of nowhere. Surely this is the house of God. Men, Monday morning, you're bleary eyed, you're shaving to go to work, there's bills to pay. Ladies, there's problems in life. You're in the emergency room, that's the house of God. When you're on the sick bed, that's the house of God. The Lord is in this place. How many times have we told you, and I won't entertain him today, but Lord, you know, he said, it's just two or more of you here. I'm here in a very special way. This is the house of God, and he's with us today. Now, this is called the doctrine of divine eminence. Let me give you a little bit of doctrine here. The divine eminence. And I'm not gonna, the word eminence in the English language is spelled three different ways and has three different meanings. I won't spell. Uh, the one eminence, uh, means something's about to happen. The imminent return of Christ. War with China is imminent. And then the one that starts with the E, E-M-M-I-E-N-C, imminence, is, it means someone who is very powerful and influential. What do we call the Queen of England? Your imminence. The third word, like the first, is spelled I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E. And that means imminent, divine imminence means God is everywhere in his creation. Paul quoted this when he spoke to an affluent group of Greeks who were educated. He quoted one of their philosophers who had written this statement, for in him we live and move and have our being. Uh, and now we have to be, to be careful. And by the way, our modern word for this would be omnipresence. God is everywhere. But I would like the word divine eminence I'm going to explain in a minute because it's more comprehensive. Here we have to become, we, we come dangerously close to the pantheism of the Hindu. The Hindu believes that God is the sum total of everything. God is the sum total of everything. That's why you can't kill an ant or a snake or a cow because you're killing part of God. But see, that is the denial of a personal God. It denies that there is a personal God at all who relates to us. It says he's just impersonal. He's everything combined. But the Bible says that in divine eminence, that God is two sides. God is, first of all, transcendent above his creation. He is fundamentally unknowable. And that is why the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us that we might know him. And the flip side is not only is he transcendent so that no one can know him apart from Christ, yet he is imminent within everything. John wrote that in him, in Jesus, was life. All things was made by him and through him and for him. We had a beautiful golden retriever named Buddy. Years ago, he had amber eyes. And he was beautiful. And he was loving. And I'd be sitting at the computer. He'd come up and place his head right there. And he'd be looking up with these amber, those amber eyes. And I remember many times thinking, I'm looking at the very life of God. Why? Because in him was life. All life. The Bible says, in fact, this is the light that lights every man that comes in the world. Hitler's life. The life force was given to him by Christ. And one day we took that dog. We, we had already been there. We went to the next day to the vet where he had surgery. And he stretched out on the table. And we watched the light of life extinguish like a candle in those amber eyes. And he died. Our God's an awesome God, folks. Jacob came out of the encounter with a new consciousness. A relation that God is everywhere all the time. But we're blinded that, to that reality by the veil of the five senses. We're locked in here. We're not able to see it. But as believers, the Bible says, by the eye of faith, we do see God. Have you seen him sometime by the eye of faith? We have different views of him. You know, Sherry always pictures her, this humongous throne and his babies are around him. Around it, you know, and, and by the way, that's why I'm not knocking it. The Presbyterians will allow any picture of Christ in their churches because they believe it's a graven image. I, I don't so much disagree with them, though I'll make a big point of that. God said, how can you make anything you cannot make anything that is an apt description of who I am. Now, two things today. The fact of God's presence, he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And then the failure to recognize God's presence, I knew it not. Okay? The fact of God's presence, he says, surely the Lord is in this place. Now, the Lord is here right now. Ecclesiastes says this to us when we come to church, Ecclesiastes 5. He says, walk prudently and be careful when you go to, house, to the house of God. Draw near and listen rather than speak and give the sacrifice of fools. 
They do not what, not what they that they do evil, and do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. And don't let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the angel of what? Angels. Preacher, I knew that God was here, but you mean angels are here? Don't kid yourself. And don't say before the angel, I didn't mean that. He was like, no, you did mean it. And why would you make God angry at your excuse and cause him to destroy the work of your hands? Why? That's how that should be posted on the door of every church in America. When you go to church, you know what I thank God for the unity we have here? How precious is it? We've been six months old and we've never had the first whimper of any kind of discontent. And how, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The Bible says, but there are churches all over America. They will go and they'll gossip and they'll do this. And all kinds of sin are brought into the church. Now each doctrine through the years has come to have its own passage of scripture associated with it. For instance, if we were to speak on love this morning, where would we turn? Which chapter? 1 Corinthians 13, that's right. If we were to speak on faith this morning, where would we turn? Hebrews 11. But if you want to talk about the divine eminence or the omnipresence of God, take your Bible and turn to Psalm 139. We're finished here in Genesis now. And I'm going to read you the first 18 verses of this chapter. And you listen to how close God is, what the Holy Spirit showed David. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down. Look at me. That's when you're down and out. That's when you fall into sin. And you know my rising up. Hallelujah. He restores my soul. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And you're acquainted with all my ways. But there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You've hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Hallelujah. Why isn't that wonderful? I heard a guy say years ago, there's two angels following every Christian of the day they die. Surely goodness and loving kindness. Goodness and loving kindness are following you all the days of your life. In verse 6, David just freaks out on it. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And if I say the darkness has fallen upon me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, indeed the darkness and light do not hide from you. The night shines as a day and darkness and light are both alike to you. For you form my inward parts and you cover me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. And my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. You saw my substance being yet unformed. Look at me. It ain't a life. It's just an embryo. Holy cow. He said, when I was a blob, you couldn't tell what I was. He said, you were knitting me together and your eyes saw my substance. And that's not the cast kill of anybody who's had an abortion. Every one of us here knew have people or family members that have. We don't condemn them at all. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. I mean, a lot of young girls have abortions out of pressure. Their family pressures them. They're ashamed. They're pregnant. The women don't, don't kick their teeth in. Don't you dare do that. You should love. Verse 16, your eyes saw my substance being unformed, and in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. And how precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And if I should count them, they will be more in number than the sand. And when I'm awake, when I wake, I'm still with you. By the way, don't you love that? <laughs> Oh, the morning after. <laughs> when I'm awake, you're still with me. A loved one dies, but when I wake, 
Lord, you're still with me. <laughs> now, there are three passages in the Bible, I'm not going to have you turn, but I'll tell you, where people become aware of God's presence and are taken with utter terror. Uh, many people, folks, in the world, they're, they're never aware of God's presence until they're awakened at the moment of death or right before death. I know some women in Edenton, they know exactly who they are, uh, and they're nurses. And a couple of them told me years ago there was a, a nursing home in Edenton. I used to preach there when I was 19 years old in my first ministry. And there was this years ago, there was a man there who had lived a very, very immoral, I won't get into specifics, but a very perverse lifestyle, a wealthy man. And this man, I'm not telling you secondhand, I, I mean, people who saw this told me this, people very close to me, had been almost comatose. And, and they said that he went into a point of he was dying. And all of a sudden they said he stood straight up in that bed. A man who could barely move and begin to literally tear and rip those sheets. And he said he ran in place and said, I'm on fire. I'm on fire. And he fell dead. He was awakened. Oh, folks. We can't fathom the reality of hell. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Spurgeon, by the way, said, don't think about it much. Spurgeon said, don't dwell on it much. It'll drive you nuts. The first of these three meals, Belshazzar, and if you've been in my ministry, you hear me allude to him regularly. But of course, he was the great-great-grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, who God humbled, made him eat grass. He has a party for a thousand of his lords, his government officials. Now, Babylon was opulent. They say there were gold-plated trays on wheels and peacocks with pull-up with the best wines and cheeses in the world. And in those days, like the Romans, you had a party and drank. When it was so good, you couldn't have it. You go outside and vomit it up. And it was gluttony. And come back in and eat and drink more. And you know how sin is. It's, you know, you had to keep your kicks. You got to get worse and worse. More and more heroin, more and more crack, more and more sex. And it devolved into sexual orgies and went on for a week of debauchery. And one day, with nothing left to do, Belshazzar said, you know, remember when we went to Israel, to the, people, the Jehovah God, those people, and remember we took utensils out of that temple of that Jehovah God, that jerk, that, that joke. Go get those utensils and let's drink wine and praise. And it was the demon gods of gold and silver. And man, the minute he did, the writing appeared on the wall. And the Bible says his knees popped together. And I shared recently in the Hebrew language, it literally meant he soiled himself. And they couldn't interpret it. So finally said, there's an old prophet that was here. He's over 100 years old now. In the days of Nebuchadnezzar, his name is Daniel. He said, go get him. And Daniel came and basically said this. He said, you know, you, you knew all of this. You knew about your grandfather. And he said this. He said, the God, you've been waiting the balances and found lacking. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and who owns all of your ways, you have not acknowledged and you will die tonight. And he did because the Medes and Persians were digging underneath the city of rivers running through it. Now, folks, when Daniel said that, a red light and a bell flashed and began to bang in Belshazzar's head. And I believe it said this, God is here. God has showed up. David said God is not in their thoughts at all. Can you imagine living an entire lifetime and never once bowing over your meal to say, thank you, Lord, for my daily food? There are people like that. God showed up. By the way, folks, never think for a moment in our worst sins that God is not there. Oh, Christian, this is sad for all of us. Never think for a moment in your worst sin that he's not there. You drag him through the filth of it. And then one of the Bible says he can be grieved and quenched. And then the next one is in Luke 12. This is the, what they call the rich fool. And this man was practicing honest, legitimate enterprise. You know the story. He'd grown wealthy. And notice the self. And I, he said, all of a sudden, he said, and I'm going to rebuild all this stuff and bigger barns. And he said, look at what I have done and look at my barns and my crops and my fields and my livestock. And the Lord said, you fool. The night your soul will be required of you. You know what, folks? God has always been present with that man. When as a young man, he bought his first cow, his first lamb, dug his first well, planted his first vineyard. God was there. 
His fatal flaws, he neglected the divine eminence, the omnipresence of God, until one day God showed up and said, you're a fool. And tonight, it's all going to be taken away from you. And then the third one, folks, were men and women who have cared nothing for God are awakened with utter horror is in Revelation 6. He's coming. He's coming. And he said, I saw the sixth seal. And behold, there's a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as figs dropped late in the season by a mighty wind. And the sky receded like a scroll when it's rolled up. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the generals, every slave and poor man, hid themselves in the caves and rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb on the throne. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who will be able to stand? Holy cow. Don't ever say the blessing. Don't you mention that name. Not politically correct. Don't you talk about him in school. Have the drag queens come and straddle two year olds in the second grade, but don't you dare mention that name. No, you kick him out because the Bible says they hate him and don't want to retain him even in their knowledge. Folks, hell is a place where the presence of God or the sense of it leaves a man forever. And I tell you what I did to the Son of God who created everything. It made him shriek in horror. And he said, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Imagine having a spouse that loves you. They love you so much and you love them. And there's no other man or woman could ever take their place. Never. Somewhere along the way you get weak or just get selfish and you cheat on them. Oh, but you still love them more than anyone. Of course, no one ever found out, but one day they did find out. They turned around and walked away from you forever. The sense of guilt, shame, remorse, loss, sorrow, and agony will gnaw for you to the day you die. You'll remarry, but you'll never get over the scene of that one you love turning their back and walking away from you forever. And folks, we don't know what it means. So one day God's going to do that. You know, Jesus said, I don't pray for this world. What? I don't pray for this world. Father, I just pray for those you gave me out of this world. The fact of God's presence, surely the Lord's in this place. Second and last, I'll spend most of my time on the first point. The failure to recognize it. He said, I knew it not. Why did Jacob not recognize God's presence? You know he'd been taught by Abraham and Isaac, his grandfather and father. But folks, his senses were dull. See, Jacob wanted to do the will of God in Jacob's way. And that's the thing. See, we want to build a church our way. We better build it God's way. He, he had just run away from stealing the birthright and the blessing and deceived his dad and his brother. And we also fail to recognize. Now, briefly, a couple of reasons. Number one, we can fail to recognize God's presence because of sin. Sin will dull our senses. And we say, I want to have my spiritual senses sharpened. So we go to seminars. And we have someone pray for us and anoint us with oil and go to revival. No. You know the best way to have your spiritual senses sharpened? Obey. It's been said obedience is the best commentary on scripture. But sometimes we do everything but obey the Lord. None of us obey him perfectly. We none of us, Solomon said, Lord, if you mark iniquity, no man can stand. But I tell you, I'm obeying a lot better today at 66 than I was when I was young. I still have pockets of resistance. But I try to do his will. I don't want to sin. See, in John 14, 21, Jesus talks about the person to whom God will manifest himself. The person to whom God will show his glory is the one that prays loud. The one that sings pretty, no. He that has my commandments and keeps them, obedience. He is the one that loves me. And I will come and I will manifest myself to him. The disciples asked him a question. How? Verse 22, if a man loves me, he will keep my commands, he will obey. And I and my Father will come and manifest myself to him. We fail to perceive God's presence because of sin. And we fail to perceive God's presence also because we fail to commune with him in prayer and meditation. That's why we try to make a big deal of prayer here, folks. The promise of James is drawn out of God, he'll draw out of you. Now listen, can you imagine 
your spouse and your relationship with her men, just pick on the men. When you never take time to talk to her, you don't look her in the eye but flip channels on the TV. You don't tell her you love her. You never take time to hold her close in intimacy and make love to her. First Corinthians said if you do that, you defraud your spouse and you cause them to commit adultery. Did you know that? You withhold that love from your spouse. God created sex for two reasons, the procreation of the human race and to keep intimacy in marriage, and that's what it's about. But you don't do any of that. And come in my office one day, by the way, none of you have. Preach y'all, my wife just don't seem to relate to me anymore. <laughs> I guess not. You treat her like no more than a mushroom out in the yard. <laughs> and folks, God's a personality. And he wants relationship with us. Psalm 25 says the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. He'll show him his covenant. He'll tell him his secrets. He called Abraham his friend. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide beneath the shadow of the Almighty. The secret place is quiet time. And then let me say that we've, we, we don't recognize the presence of God. And I'm going to wrap it up with this. And this is probably more important than anything I've said yet. Because we have lost the biblical view of God and replaced it with an anemic, man-centered gospel. We accentuate one side of the gospel and neglect the other. When Paul, in Romans chapter 1, described the gospel, he said two things. In the gospel, first of all, the righteousness or mercy of God revealed from faith to faith, for the just of the faith. The righteousness and mercy. But Paul said there's another side. And in the gospel, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now you got that? Two sides to this thing. And we don't perceive the presence of God today because we've, oh, we, we've wiped out one side. In studying this, God laid upon my heart to Google old cigarette commercials. And I'm making a point. And it was fun. I think they stopped them. Thank God the government made them stop in the 70s. You can take Salem out of the country, but you can't take the country out of Salem or something like that. <laughs> Terryton, remember the black eye? We'd rather fight than switch. <laughs> Lucky Strike, appeared at smooth flavor. Mild taste, fine tobacco. Terryton, refreshing flavor, cool, clean pleasure, mild mint flavor. <coughs> Kent, refine away the harsh flavor and rough taste, the finer the filter, the milder the taste. A refreshing way to take a walk on the beach. <laughs> now, I mean, people are stupid. And then they had a, the Chesterfield had a young Ronald Reagan with a cigarette in his mouth. He said, I'm sending all my friends Chesterfields for Christmas for the merriest Christmas any smoker can have. And that was just one side of the cigarette experience, and it cost millions and millions and tens of millions of people their lives because they didn't show them the other side. But today, thank God, on a pack of cigarettes, you have both sides. There's a little block, and it says this. Smoking cigarettes can cause fatal head and neck cancer. Give cancer to your children, though they don't smoke. Bladder cancer, cataracts that lead to blindness, emphysema, lung cancer, diabetes, heart disease, premature death, coronary, coronary, coronary artery disease, sinus disease, arthritis, and degenerative bone disease. Boom! There's the other side of the coin. And the Holy Spirit said, Paul, you tell him this in the gospel. The righteousness and mercy of God are revealed. And the flip side, the wrath of God. I came back from the, we come back from the funeral for Cherry's aunt this week, and I saw a billboard, and it was for the Franklin Graham campaign coming up. He tore through all these little towns in North Carolina. It's wonderful. And it said, God loves you. And Julie's going to help with that. Sherry wouldn't want to meet. So I don't have a problem with hearing God love you, but just, just indulge me for a minute. God loves you. Here's a lost man. Like some of the buddies I grew up with, he's profligate, he's immoral. God's not in his thoughts. He's self-centered. He never prays over his food. He denies himself no fleshly indulgence. So he cries by and says, God loves you. You know what he thinks himself, I believe? Hippie. God loves me. I'm okay, you're okay. Let's live and let live. I'm only going to live once. I do like the old beer commercial says. Let's go for the gut stuff. I'm not saying, folks, it's wrong to tell him that because he might have had a bad childhood and it's good to hear that God loves him. And maybe that draws him because Jude says, some are saved with compassion and some with fear. 
I would rather see the billboard say this to a lost man. Because God loves me, good, i got nothing to worry about. Three-fourths of the Bible is law. One-fourth is grace. I wish it said, he that has the Son of God has life. And he that does not have the Son of God shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides upon him. And as the psalmist said, God is angry with the wicked every day. Amen. Ooh. <laughs> Did it say ooh? Ooh, no. I'm planning on seeing two different girls tonight. And I've got a big drug ring I've got. And I've left my wife and children. And you see the difference? We've got an anemic gospel. It's a gospel of self-enhancement, folks. Listen, I love the song, The Savior's Waiting, but just indulge me again. We'll close. I love to hear Greg Howitt sing it. Play it, and it brings me to tears. But the truth of the matter is, folks, that song reduces the living God to a puddle of sentimental tears. Time after time, he's waited before. Now he's waiting again. To see if you're willing to open the door, he's crying. Because these people are rejecting me. You know. Holy cow. <laughs> he said, Father, I don't pray for this world. And no man can come to me unless my father draws him. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And whom I will, I will harden. Yeah, and read this in Genesis. Pharaoh, the reason I formed you in your mother's womb. And the reason you've come to be the leader of Egypt. I've raised you up for the sole purpose that I will kill you this day and show my power and glory to you in my children. I can take one lump of clay. This is all verses in the Bible. I can take one lump of clay and make a vessel of honor like David and Hannah. I can take another lump of clay and make a vessel of dishonor like Judas, Cain, or Hitler. And don't you dare, you dying jar of dust, look at me and say to your creator, what are you doing? And, we'll, and why have you made me thus? I will do with my own as I please. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God to whom every knee is praying. He is not weeping today after time after time after time. He's not waiting. He said, all those whom the Father has given to me, they will come to me. Amen. It's not a matter of him begging. But he that comes to me, I'll never, I'll never cast out. The Bible reveals both the righteousness and mercy of God until we regain the Bible view of Christ and him who he is. We'll never be able to walk with him in a moment-by-moment -moment awareness and be aware of his majesty and power and glory. We'll be anemic Christians, anemic pastors, and anemic churches who have no impact on the culture because you've got a watered-down, neutered gospel. <laughs> I remember Billy Kelly. He walked up from the pulpit. That's good preaching, Brother Kelly, if I am doing it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't need amens, folks. I need to know one thing. And when I stand before him, he said, I told you that if you didn't tell them the truth, I, they die and I'd hold their blood in your hands. But Paul came to the end of his life and said, no man's blood's on my hands. And I'll tell you this, I've made mistakes and I, 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 I have a lot of regrets. But I believe he bears me out in every church I've pastored and there been four of them. There's no man's blood's going to be on my hands. Not one's. Because I haven't failed to tell you. He's so precious and so gentle. But he's a living God. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden. And take my yoke. See, the yoke's made for to help get easy. So he bends down, bless his heart, and he gets in, into a yoke for us. He says, come on now. Come down here in my yoke. And let me help you. One principle, this is a conclusion, folks, that comes out of this. Every place you go is the house of God. <laughs> Every bush is a burning bush. There's no such thing as the sacred and the secular. Whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do. I was always told, you don't eat, you don't drink, it's nothing. Whether you watch TV, see, one pastor, we had couldn't watch TV. It's not don't, 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 don't. You do what God tells you to do it, but you do it to his glory. And if you can't do it to his glory, don't do it. But he says everything, every place, everywhere, when we walk in the awareness of God's presence, our life becomes a sacrament, just like the bread and cup of the communion table. And our lives become drink offerings poured out to the Lord. And here's where we glorify him. Whether it's a job promotion or a marriage breaking up, Strong health for cancer and impending death. 
whether we continue to meet here in freedom or they come in here and padlock the doors one day so we'll arrest you if you go to church. Mental illness, depression, or joy unspeakable. A child that exceeds all your expectations or a child that repeatedly breaks your heart. A church that grows to 2,000 or a church that never exceeds 100. Great wealth, dire poverty, the vitality of youth that I used to have, and the onset of old age and weakness that I now have. In the midst of it all, there stands one like the fourth man in the fire furnace. His name is El Roy, the God who sees. Jehovah Shema, the God who is here, the God who is there. And this is the great principle that comes out of this, folks. It'll make it easier to live for God. When you realize everything you do, he's there. And I love this. It's the key to peace. Did you know that? He says, I will keep you in perfect peace. If your heart is stayed upon me. Wow. If you keep thinking about me. Keep me in your mind. Keep me in your heart. I'll keep you in peace. See, sometimes when the Spirit of God comes, there's a flow. And I'm in the flow, but i got to stop. <laughs> but I like to get on my wrath and just stay on this flow all day long. He's a living God. He, we can know him. We can be his friend. I've told you this a thousand times. I close with this, but I've always loved it. Abraham, it said, God talked to Abraham face to face like a man talks to his friend. And it says that Abraham was God's friend. But old David, with all of his laws, was God's lover. Oh, I'll take that any day of the week. You can have me and his friend or him talk. He was his lover. Passion. That's what got him in trouble, by the way. His gift on one side can be worked for that. His passion with everything he did. He danced before the Lord till his clothes came off. But he loved the Lord. You know why he was aware of him? He said, I stand in the field at night and I talk to him. And they saw him. He said, I will love you, O Lord. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. Because he has delivered me, I'll call upon him all the days of my life. You can feel the love oozing. Don't you want to be God's lover? We love you, Father, today. You can take us and you can mold us. And Lord, you know, I'm aware at 66 and I'm still growing. I really am aware of that. And I know, Lord, I'm a lot closer to you than I was 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And you're teaching me your grace. And especially, Lord, that your grace is greater than my sins. So many years, Lord, I looked at my flesh and I thought, Lord, how can you have communion? But Lord, you I think sometimes you allow us to continue to struggle until we finally realize that doesn't impede your love to us. That you wrote our names in your book before the foundation of the world. And Jesus, you said to tell us that I was paid in full. And that you've forgiven us all trespasses. And you say, Don't worry about what you're struggling with. Come boldly, come to Papa, come sit on my lap. Listen to me. Don't run like Adam and Eve and hide in the trees. I thank you for that grace and that love. Take what I've said today and fulfill your promise that your word will never return to you void, but that it will always accomplish that for which you intended. Bless it to those watching online, Lord. Take away our, ane our anemic view of you, God, and make us robust, healthy Christians and make us a robust, healthy church that preaches and practices your presence when we come together. And we did that in that prayer time today, and that's what that's about. Teach us to pray. Continue, Lord, to cultivate that. That's the strength of our church, not my preaching. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.